Indian's flat track inspired FTR 1200 was already pretty great in my book. A totally unique package, well specced components, and a punchy V twin that will put a big smile on your face. But this week, they've announced some revisions, and personally, I'm not sure if they're for the better or the worse, so stick with me for 10 of the FTR's new features, and I'll tell you why. But before we get started, if you're new here and you want to see more of the latest motorcycle news and reviews right here on YouTube, then please do remember to hit subscribe. First up, the name. It used to be the FTR 1200, but now it's just the FTR. That's not reflective of any change to the engine and its capacity. It's just what people have been calling the bike, I guess, and Indian have leaned into it. You've still got basically the same four models with the base FTR, the FTR S, which is a bit more flashy, and then the FTR R Carbon, which goes all out in terms of blink with carbon bodywork, as the name suggests. For the more retro rider, there's the FTR Rally, which has a bit of a scrambler style and spec. But the headline change for the new model year is the wheel diameter, which isn't something you can say for many bike launches. The previous generation was a little awkward with an 18 inch rear and 19 at the front to give it more of a genuine flat tracker appearance and handling characteristics. But the skinniness of the rear meant that it was sometimes a little light on grip, whilst the less common sizes meant that good road tire choices were pretty limited with Dunlop's semi knobbly DT3 designed specifically for this bike as probably your best option. For the new model year, Indian have conceded that 17-inch wheels are used on most road bikes for a reason, and also that road tyres are best for the road and that punters would benefit from plenty of choice. So the FTR, FTR-S and FTR-R Carbon will all roll on 17-inch cast aluminium rims from now on, with Metzler Sportex fitted as standard. And that's where I'm a bit torn, because on the one hand, it'll almost certainly handle a little sharper, and when I borrowed one from Crazy Horse London last year, it didn't take too much to get the rear skipping about, so the extra grip at the rear would be appreciated. But in this change, will it lose some of the character that makes it different and therefore interesting to ride? It's become slightly more like other naked bikes, and for me, its uniqueness was one of the FTR's greatest assets. I guess I'll have to ride one to find out, but in the meantime, I'd love to hear your take in the comments below. The FTR Rally keeps the 18 rear and 19 front, by the way, which makes sense if if you genuinely intend to off-road it. Now, as a result of the change in wheel size, the geometry has had to be revised to compensate with a steeper rake of 25 degrees and a shorter trail of 99.9 millimeters. Indians say that this also contributes to the sharper handling of the new model. The bars have also been narrowed by a not insignificant 40 millimeters, presumably as less leverage is required to turn in the new 17 inch front, or in Indian's words, to support the bike's nimble handling and give riders more control. In its previous incarnation, the FTR 1200 had 150 millimeters of suspension travel front and rear across all models, which again was more in line with the flat tracker semi off road ethos than a true road bike. Moving forward, the FTR, the S, and the R carbon will get 30 mil less at 120, with just the rally retaining the full boinginess for tackling trails and the like. 120 mil is pretty much in line with what you'd expect for a road-focused bike, but again, it does detract a little from the FTR's original inspiration, and that could be a good or bad thing depending on what you're after. One major positive for shorter riders is that the seat height is now reduced with the previous generation standing fairly tall at 840 millimeters. Now I don't mind a lofty perch myself as long as I can get one foot down by shuffling over to one side, but more often than not I'm riding a press bike so I can sympathize with anyone who splashes 15 grand on an FTR R Carbon and wants to get both feet down just to be sure. A 36 mil reduction brings it down to 804 millimeters which ought to be far more palatable for those of us with reduced reach in the leg department. When I had the FTR 1200 for a day last year, I did find the throttle response a touch eager as I worked my way out of town to get to the good stuff. In the lower gears at urban speeds, it required a little more concentration than I'd have liked to get a smooth ride. But the good news is that Indians say that the new engine calibration takes advantage of the running gear enhancements by refining engine performance for a smoother, more predictable throttle 
throttle response. So that's welcome news. In fact, I mentioned the choppy throttle when I returned it to the shop and they suggested that it would run smoother once it had warmed up, which is why I might have experienced a less refined throttle at the beginning of the ride. This seems to have been picked up on by Indian as well, as they claim that the new engine calibration also improves cold starts. Another nice enhancement comes in the form of Indian's rear cylinder deactivation, which shuts down the cylinder located closest to the rider when the bike is at a standstill to save you from sweating your balls off in heavy traffic. As soon as you crack the throttle open, the rear cylinder kicks back in seamlessly and instantly as the front cylinder has been keeping the engine spinning in the meantime. It's a nice feature which was previously available on some of their bigger tourers and cruisers, so it's great to see it across the range as standard here. A nice perk for anyone holding out for this update. Last up, there have been a few shuffles in specs and some new colours. The fully adjustable sax suspension of the S now rolls down to the base FTR, for example, with the previous generation having a non-adjustable fork and just preload and rebound damping adjustment on the shock. It comes in black with red accents and costs £12,299. The FTRS gets the same upgrades as before, so the touchscreen TFT dash and connectivity, IMU-enabled lean-sensitive rider aids, and now comes with the titanium Akropovich exhaust as standard that was previously an add-on. There are two colour choices of maroon or white, and it'll cost £13,699. The FTR Carbon gets carbon bodywork, Olin suspension, the Akropovich can, and the proper race style paint job, costing £15,599, whilst the rally comes in at £12,999 with its long travel suspension, taller bars, and larger spoke wheels, and with just one colour choice of titanium smoke. And so there we have it, the Indian FTR range for 2021. Well, they're calling it 2022, but it's available in April this year, so you do the maths. You can't blame them though, time is more of an abstract concept now we're all stuck at home. Hopefully I'll be able to get out and ride one of these soon and report back on those new little wheels. In the meantime, I'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below. Would you prefer the aggressive throttle response, longer travel suspension and bigger tracker style wheels of the previous generation? Or have Indian done the right thing by building a bike for where it'll realistically do most of its miles in order to make a better bike and hopefully shift more units? I'd love to know what you think of it in the comments below and if you're new here and you want to see more videos like this hit subscribe and i'll catch you next time